I'm Eric, and this is the Commander's Beacon. And we're here to talk about some unconventional ways that you might build your commander deck. So it seems like every 10 or 20 years or so, someone decides to build a car that's, you know, amphibious and it can also be a boat, or maybe it's got foldable wings and it can, you know, fly like it's an airplane. And and usually such a car is is really terrible as a car on the road, and it's also really terrible as a boat or as a plane. And nobody likes it, and and they forget about this idea for 10 or 20 years, and then someone else comes up with this idea and decides to make another terrible boat car or car plane or something. Now that I think about it, this isn't a really a great analogy for what we're trying to do here, because we want to make unconventional decks that are actually good. So, yeah, let's let's just ignore that for now. Anyways, today we're talking about sagas in Commander, and with even more sagas being added in Kaldheim, I think this is the perfect time to start thinking about building a saga-themed deck. Alright, welcome to the Complete Guide to Sagas in Commander. Uh, we're going to start by describing how sagas work, how to abuse them, how to win with them, and which commanders are good choices to lead decks built around them. Well, the goal here is to give you a primer to begin building a deck focused around sagas. So I won't be going over sagas that you can add to existing decks that might just benefit from a saga or two that happen to fit that deck's theme, uh, like using a Herald Unites the Elves in an Elf Tribal deck. Uh, instead, we're going to go over several different ways and several different commanders that let you build a deck with lots of sagas and why you might want to do so. But first, what exactly is a saga? First, sagas are enchantments, so a saga-themed deck will benefit from any of your other enchantment payoffs, like Argothian Enchantress. But sagas are typically temporary. Now, we can fix that, but we'll talk more about that later. The sagas will do a few things, spread out over a few turns generally, and then they go away. But let's use Battle of Frost and Fire as an example. First, notice that sagas have rules text in the upper left part of the card, so this tells you most of what you need to know about how the card functions. First, a saga enters the battlefield with zero lore counters on it, and it gets a lore counter immediately when it enters the battlefield. And whenever a saga gets a lore counter, the ability associated with that counter called a chapter, will get added to the stack. For Battle of Frost and Fire, it'll get its first lore counter when it enters the battlefield, and if we look to the Roman numeral 1 on the card, again the first chapter, it puts the ability, uh, Battle of Frost and Fire deals 4 damage to each non-giant creature and each planeswalker on the stack. We can also see that sagas get an additional lore counter right after your draw step each turn. So assuming you had cast Battle of Frost and Fire during your main phase and gotten the first lore counter on it, you'll typically get the next lore counter at the beginning of your next turn, again right after the draw step. So Battle of Frost and Fire's second chapter will go onto the stack, which is Scry 3. And when a saga has lore counters equal to or greater than its maximum, a 3 in the case of Battle of Frost and Fire, it'll be sacrificed as a state-based action after the last lore ability has resolved. So on our second turn, after casting Battle of Frost and Fire, we'll get our third chapter. Whenever you cast a spell with converted mana cost 5 or greater this turn, draw two cards and discard a card. And then, assuming that the Saga still has three or more loyalty counters on it after this ability resolves, we will sacrifice it. So there are currently Sagas with as few as three and as many as four lore triggers or chapters on them. Now, Sagas were first introduced in Dominaria. They were released again in Theros Beyond Death, and they're returning for a third set now with Kaldheim. So I think it's a great time to revisit Sagas and Commander. I typically like to see at least three sets or so featuring a mechanic before you can really build uh, cool and unique or an effective decks around it most of the time. There are currently approximately 44 Sagas in all of Magic, and I say approximately because I'm preparing this video before all of the Kaldheim spoilers have been revealed, and it's looking like there will be 20 Sagas in Kaldheim, uh, two of each two-color combination, but that's uh, an estimate at this point. So there should be around 44 Sagas by the time Kaldheim fully releases. Of those, four are white, five are blue, six are black, 
four are red, and four are green. And 20, or again approximately 20, I'm estimating, are multicolored. And again, all of the multicolored ones uh, come from Kaldheim. So almost half of all the sagas in Magic are new in Kaldheim, so this set was pretty important for enabling a saga-themed commander deck. Uh, that said, be mindful that some of the Kaldheim sagas are tribal-focused, so they might not be as functional outside of those tribes. Invasion of the Giants, for example, lets you scry two for chapter one. Uh, for chapter two, you draw a card, then you may reveal a giant card from your hand, and when you do, Invasion of the Giants deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. And chapter three reduces the cost of the next giant spell you play until your next turn. So outside of a giant tribal deck, this saga is not very useful. And there are several other tribal-themed sagas from Kaldheim that might not make sense to play when sagas themselves are our targeted tribe. Now, many themed decks, for example, a Cycling or Spell Slinger or Pirates, for example, will use 25 to 40 cards that all fit that theme, or maybe even more. But with only 44 sagas in all of Magic, and then again, that's if you're playing a five-color deck, will be available to you. So it will be hard to come up with 25 to 40 playable sagas in most decks. But I don't think you need to. A lot of your basic deck functionality, like mana ramp, card draw, and some removal, it can't be completely filled by sagas at this point. So I think you'll be able to get away with playing a smaller number of sagas. Uh, think of sagas perhaps like Planeswalkers. A Super Friends deck might typically play 15 to 25 Planeswalkers uh, just because they'll need support from other card types. So I think our Sagas deck will also play somewhere in this range of 15 to 25 Sagas with other cards filling a supportive role. Now again, since Sagas are enchantments, you may choose to use other enchantments and enchantment synergy pieces like we mentioned earlier. But I do have a couple of concerns about Sagas. Uh, if I play Cryptolith Rite, for example, my creatures can tap for mana of any color. Uh, for the same mana cost, I could instead play Song of Freilis, and those creatures can then also tap for one mana of any color, but only for two turns. And then they'll get a one-turn combat boost, and then my Song of Freilis goes away completely. With a Cryptolith Rite, of course, my creatures keep tapping for a mana forever, or, or until an opponent removes it. Well, okay, what if we examine the Eldest Reborn? This saga costs 5 mana, and it immediately, when you play it, each opponent has to sacrifice a creature or planeswalker. And this is sort of like Liliana's Triumph, sort of. Uh, that's an instant that forces each opponent to sacrifice a creature. It's only 2 mana, though. And if you happen to have a Liliana planeswalker, they also discard a card. Now, on my next turn, the Eldest Reborn will also make each opponent discard a card. So again, that's going to mimic the best-case scenario for Liliana's Triumph, or maybe it's just Ravenous Rats, another 2-mana card. And the final lore counter for the Eldest Reborn basically gives me Rise from the Grave, a 5-mana sorcery that puts a creature from any graveyard onto the battlefield under my control. So the Eldest Reborn sort of combines all three of these cards, Liliana's Triumph, Ravenous Rats, and Rise from the Grave, all into one. Now this does save me 2 cards and 4 mana, and that's a big deal but it also spreads out these effects over three turns, and that's also a big deal. I mean, let's say your opponent has Elish Norn in their graveyard, and you're facing down lethal damage from an army of token creatures. A Rise from the Grave will save you now. You can't really afford to cast the Eldest Reborn and then wait two turns to reanimate Elish Norn. You'll be dead by then. And even if you're not dead by then, your opponents also have two turns to figure out what you're trying to do and stop you, maybe by destroying the Eldest Reborn, or by getting Elish Norn out of said graveyard. So in order to make Sagas a real, winnable deck, we need to at least address to some degree uh, these two drawbacks. Their transients and their delayed effects. Uh, let's go over some ways to do this. So the first thing I want to talk about is manipulating lore counters. We can remove lore counters from sagas, and this will address their transients. Or we can add lore counters to them, and this will address their delayed effects. Uh, let's first talk about removing lore counters. Let's say I have a Hex Parasite. This is a 1-1 artifact creature that costs 1, and it lets me pay X and I Phyrexian black mana, uh, that's either 1 black mana or 2 life, to remove X counters from a permanent. 
So with Hex Parasite, I can pay just two mana per turn, or one mana and two life, to reset one Saga's lore counters indefinitely. For example, let's say I cast a Showdown of the Scalds, and I have a Hex Parasite on the battlefield. Now from Showdown of the Scalds, I get to exile the top four cards of my library and play those cards until the end of my next turn, uh, when the Saga enters the battlefield. And then any time before my next turn's draw step, I can activate Hex Parasite's ability with X equals 1 to remove that lore counter from Showdown of the Scalds. Then on my next upkeep, it'll have zero lore counters, and it'll go up to one lore counter after my draw step, so I will again exile four more cards that again I can play until the end of my next turn. So I get to dig through my deck indefinitely at a rate of four cards per turn, as long as I can remove that one lore counter every turn. Now depending on which saga I'm using, this ability can be deceptively good. Uh, let's say instead I have a Phyrexian Scriptures in play. And once it gets up to two lore counters, it says, destroy all non-artifact creatures. Then all I need to do is remove one lore counter with Hex Parasite. Uh, by the way, this is an artifact creature, so Phyrexian Scriptures won't kill it. Uh, so I just remove that one lore counter each turn to get a permanent wrath effect for all non-artifact creatures on every single one of my turns. And there are many more sagas that you can do broken things by removing a lore counter every turn. Uh, let's say I have a Carter's Vicious Return in play. Now the third and final chapter for this saga says, Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on it, it gains haste until your next turn. Now I can let Carter's Vicious Return go up to three lore counters and put that third chapter ability on the stack. But before the triggered ability resolves, uh, letting me put a creature card from my graveyard onto the battlefield, I can use Hex Parasite to remove a lore counter from the saga. Now the third chapter ability will still resolve, but then the state-based action checks to see if the saga should be sacrificed, and it will only find two lore counters, so you won't sacrifice the saga. So by removing lore counters from sagas at instant speed, when that saga's um, last chapter ability is put onto the stack, you can repeatedly trigger any single lore ability you want, even the last lore ability that would typically cause the saga to be sacrificed. Now, there aren't too many cards that remove any type of counter from any type of permanent. A Hex Parasite is one of the best for a Saga's deck, but there are a few other passable ones. Chisei Heart of Oceans removes one counter from any permanent you control for free once each upkeep. It's also a legendary creature, but I wouldn't build a Saga's deck around it. A Chisei is mono blue, and as we noted before, a blue only has five Sagas, uh, but it's a reasonable include in the 99 of a Saga-focused deck. A Pharopede can also remove one lore counter from one Saga once per turn. This is a 3-mana unblockable 1-1 one -one artifact creature that can remove a counter from a permanent when it deals combat damage to a player. Power Conduit is a 2-mana artifact that can tap and remove a counter from a permanent to put a charge counter on an artifact or put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a creature. There's Vampire Hexmage. This is an old commander staple. It's a 2-1 vampire with first strike that costs 2 black, and it can be sacrificed to remove all counters from target permanent. This is great for killing planeswalkers, but since it's a single-use effect, I wouldn't really recommend that you use this card in a Saga's deck. There's Clock Spinning. This is an instant that can remove a single counter from a permanent for 1 blue mana, but it has buyback for 3, so you can use it repeatedly. Now, clock spinning is really cool because it can also add counters to permanents, uh, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. So anyways, removing lore counters from sagas, very cool. But even when we do this, we'll still generally only trigger those sagas once per turn. And that is a lot of value, but it might not be explosive enough to win games. So let's talk about how we might solve that problem. And that is, of course, by adding lore counters to sagas. Now one fact about sagas that isn't immediately evident from the help text is that their lore abilities trigger whenever a lore counter is added to them. Now by default that'll happen after your draw step at the, be at the beginning of each of your turns. But if you can add a lore counter to a saga at any other time, you can add the saga's next chapter ability to the stack right away. And note that this doesn't work in reverse. Uh, when we talked about removing lore counters, uh, let's say we have uh, the first Iron Games on the battlefield, and it has three lore counters on it. If I remove a lore counter, bringing it onto two lore counters, it won't trigger the second chapter ability to let me put three plus one plus one counters on a creature I control. A lore abilities or chapters only trigger when a lore counter is added to the saga, 
not when it is removed. So that means if the first Nyroan games is sitting at one lore counter, and I can add a lore counter at instant speed, then I can trigger that second chapter to put three plus one plus one counters on a creature I control at instant speed. So while removing lore counters allowed us to keep sagas around uh, potentially indefinitely, adding lore counters lets us generate their effects faster, which can mean the difference between winning and losing. So how do we add lore counters? Well, we already mentioned clock spinning, uh, which can repeatedly add or remove a single lore counter for one mana at a time, but there's generally far more cards that will add lore counters than there are cards that remove them. Uh, animation module, for example, is a one mana artifact. It lets us pay three and tap it to add a lore counter to a saga. Well, technically, it adds a counter to a permanent of a type that permanent already has, but in this case, it's adding a lore counter to a saga that has a lore counter on it. A Skyship Plunderer is a 2-mana two 2-1 two flyer that can also do the same. It lets us add a lore counter to a Saga whenever it deals combat damage to a player. But of course, the best way to add lore counters to Sagas is with Proliferate. Magic has 33 cards featuring the Proliferate mechanic, and the mechanic is generally very powerful in our format. When you Proliferate, you get to pick any number of permanents or players with counters on them and give them another counter of a type they already have. So a single proliferate trigger can add a lore counter to any or all of your sagas at, at one time. Now proliferate is going to be the most efficient way to amplify multiple sagas very rapidly. Contagion Engine, for example, is a 6 mana artifact and it lets you proliferate twice by paying 4 mana and tapping it. There's Evolution Sage, which lets you proliferate whenever you put a land into play. So there's Flux Channeler, which lets you proliferate whenever you do something as innocuous as, say, cast a non-creature spell. And if that wasn't quite enough, Inexorable Tide lets you proliferate when you cast any spell at all. And remember our example with Phyrexian Scriptures and Hex Parasite. With this combo, we can destroy all non-artifact creatures on every one of our turns, but we don't get to start doing that until our next turn after we play the Saga. But with Proliferate, we can destroy all non-artifact creatures right now. If I have a Thrumming Bird on the battlefield, for example, I can cast Phyrexian Scriptures, then go into combat, hit an opponent with Thrumming Bird, and then proliferate, adding a second lore counter to Phyrexian Scriptures, so I trigger the second lore ability to destroy all non artifact creatures. It's still my turn, and I sort of just paid 4 mana for a creature board wipe. Uh, Damnation is still at least $40, just saying. And look, there's plenty of other good proliferate cards. I'm not going to cover them all here. But there is one thing we need to be careful of. All of the sagas right now max out at three or four lore counters. If we start proliferating too quickly, uh, we'll definitely have some explosive turns, but if those explosive plays don't result in us winning, uh, we'll have dumped all of our sagas into the graveyard very rapidly by getting up them up to their maximum uh, lore count. And then we'll need to rely on slower effects like graveyard recursion to get them back and recast them. So proliferate is definitely strong, but we probably need to be a little bit thoughtful about using it. But we've only talked about lore counter manipulation. There are other ways we can abuse our sagas. Now let's talk about those next. Now, anything that flickers a saga, that is, anything that exiles it and returns it to the battlefield, will reset its lore counters. Let's say I have a Meadowmise Prophecy, uh, which I don't recommend, this card is bad, but let's say I have it anyways, and it's about to go up to four lore counters. I can remove a lore counter with Clock Spinning, for example, to keep it from being sacrificed, but I'd need to do that every single turn for four mana each time, and Meadowmise Prophecy is definitely not worth that kind of investment. But if I flicker a Meadowmise Prophecy, for example, with Flicker of Fate, I reset the lore counters to one, so I don't have to worry about it again for a few more turns. A Flicker of Fate, for reference, is an instant that costs one and a white, and exiles a creature or enchantment we control, and then returns it to the battlefield under our control. Now, most Flicker effects are in blue or white, and most of them will only hit creatures, but there are a few which can hit any type of permanent, and these are the ones that we'll focus on here. A Teferi's Time Twist, for example, can exile any permanent we control, then return it to the battlefield under our control at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, this is an instant that costs one and a blue. A Venser the Sojourner is a five mana planeswalker with a plus two ability that lets you exile a permanent you own, then return it to the battlefield at the beginning of your next end step. 
Sudden Disappearance lets you exile all of your sagas, along with all of your other permanents, and then return them to the battlefield at the end of the turn. And there's a few creatures that blink a permanent when they enter the battlefield, like uh, Flicker Wisp, Felidar Guardian, Glamour Point Stag. But since these only happen once, they may not be worth it, uh, except in a Saga's Focus deck that can repeatedly trigger these creatures uh, enter the battlefield effects. Now remember that any of these flicker effects that can be used at instant speed can also reset Saga's as the last lore counter is added, so we can get the final lore counter trigger from the Saga without having to sacrifice the Saga. But sorcery speed effects uh, like Venser's plus two ability won't work here. Now be aware that many of these flicker effects return the permanent to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step, uh, like Teferi's Time Twist, uh, rather than immediately, like Flicker of Fate. So if I wanted to, say, Flicker the Akron War to get the first chapter ability at instant speed and steal an opponent's creature right now, I couldn't do that with Teferi's Time Twist since the saga wouldn't return to the battlefield until the end of the turn. And I also want to point out that in addition to flicker effects, uh, bouncing our sagas back to our hand will effectively reset them. Uh, they will need to pay their mana cost again. Now, if we're playing an enchantment-focused deck, then cards like Satessin Champion will draw us a card whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield. So both flicker and bounce effects will get us card draw here. But something like Seder Enchanter will only draw us a card when we cast an enchantment spell. So flickering an enchantment won't draw us a card from Seder Enchanter, but bouncing it and recasting it will. In fact, I only see two Enchantress cards that trigger from enchantments entering the battlefield rather than being cast, and those are the Satessin Champion and Eidolon of Blossoms. So if you're building a heavy enchantment-themed deck around sagas, then bounce effects might be more effective than flicker effects for you. And then finally, Dominaria created a new card-type designation called Historic. This applies to all legendaries, all artifacts, and all sagas. There are a couple of cards that reward you for doing things with historic cards. A Curator's Ward, for example, is an aura that can enchant any permanent. It gives the permanent hexproof, and when the permanent leaves the battlefield, you draw two cards if the permanent was historic. So if you put this on a Saga, which will generally leave the battlefield in a few turns anyways, uh, you'll protect it from targeted removal, and then you'll draw a couple of cards when the Saga is sacrificed after it gets its final lore counter. A Joyous Familiar is a 4-mana 2-2 flying uh, artifact creature that makes all of your historic cards cost one less to cast. I'm not sure that you'll be casting so many sagas that this is worth it, but I wanted to point it out here just in case. So we've got some ways to abuse sagas by getting repeated use out of them, or by accelerating their chapter uh, lore ability triggers. But how can we actually win the game with sagas? Now, there are a lot of sagas that are too weak to ever realistically win us the game, no matter how much we can abuse them, but I want to talk about a few different ways that you might win with sagas, and which sagas will help you do it. There's a few different ways that sagas generally might create win conditions. Either 1. By locking down your opponents, 2. By taking your opponent's resources, or 3. By generating insurmountable resource advantage for yourself. Now let's go over some sagas which fit into each of these roles, starting with the ones that lock down your opponents. Fall of the Thran destroys all lands for chapter 1. It costs 6 mana, and yes, most playgroups will probably slash your tires or something if you use mass land destruction too many times. But remember, if you remove lore counters from Fall of the Thran, then you can trigger that first chapter ability each turn, which destroys all the lands every turn. Kiora Bests the Sea God is one of the most powerful sagas, uh, rightly so for its 7 converted mana cost. It too can lock down your opponents at chapter 2, which reads, tap all non-land permanents, target opponent controls, they don't untap during their controller's next untap step. And of course we previously mentioned Phyrexian Scriptures, uh, which provides a non-artifact creature board wipe at chapter 2, so anytime you can increment lore counters up or down, you'll be able to lock your opponents down with sagas like these. And there's, there's plenty more sagas like these, but I've chosen to specifically talk about the lockdown effects that kind of apply to the whole board, or at least to one whole player. But, but there are other good ones. Uh, Time of Ice, for example, is really cool because the first two chapters let you tap a creature an opponent controls, then that creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step, 
for as long as you control time of ice. So if you can remove lore counters from time of ice, you can slowly and permanently lock down the entire board's creatures. But again, the key word here is slowly. Now, I like Time of Ice, and I would definitely play it in some Saga-focused decks, but because it only affects one creature at a time, uh, its power level will be limited, so I wouldn't consider Time of Ice to be a win condition, at least most of the time. Now, there's also a few Sagas that generate advantage for you by letting you steal resources from your opponent. We'll talk about Kiora Bests the Sea God again, uh, because it's just that good. The third chapter lets you gain control of a permanent and opponent controls, and you untap it. And again, if you can remove lore counters at instant speed, you'll be able to trigger this chapter repeatedly. The Akroan War is a pretty cool one. Its first chapter gives you control of target creature and opponent controls until the Akroan War leaves the battlefield. So this is again kind of like Time of Ice, but stealing creatures, even one at a time, can help us win much, much faster and more reliably than just tapping them down. Then there's The Eldest Reborn. Uh, the third chapter of which lets you put a creature or planeswalker from any graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Now, of course, some sagas just generate game-winning value all on their own, uh, especially if we can trigger the relevant chapters repeatedly. We've got to mention Kiora Bests the Sea God again, because chapter 1 creates an 8-8 Kraken token with Hexproof. Now, a single one of these tokens will not win us the game, but if we can make one per turn or more will likely overwhelm our opponents fairly readily. A Song of Freilis provides a mini overrun on chapter 3. Uh, this trigger puts a plus one plus one counter on each of our creatures, and it gives them Vigilance, Indestructible, and Trample until end of turn. Uh, this is pretty much as close as you can get to a free attack step without consequences. Of course, you'll need to have a significant board presence before you can win with this, and unless you can add lore counters really fast, your opponents will see it coming. And we already mentioned Showdown of the Scalds. Now this can give you absurd card advantage if you can repeat the first chapter. Again, this exiles the top four cards of your library, and you can play those cards until the end of your next turn, which is a pretty generous window. And lastly, again, I want to emphasize that there are plenty of other good playable sagas. The sagas I mentioned here were specifically the ones that I thought were most capable of winning the game all on their own, or at least with you know support from other lore counter manipulation flickering or other similar effects uh, to trigger those um, chapters multiple times. But now that we've gone over some possible win conditions, we'll need to decide who might be able to command a Saga-themed deck. Let's start with Gen, Arcanum Weaver. Again is a 3-3 human wizard that costs red, white, black. You can pay red, white, black, tap him, and sacrifice an enchantment to return an enchantment from your graveyard to the battlefield. Now, Gen obviously synergizes with Sagas. You can sacrifice a Saga as its final chapter's ability goes onto the stack, and use that sacrifice to pull another Saga out of your graveyard and straight onto the battlefield at instant speed. And with red, white, and black in his color identity, Gen gives you access to 21 Sagas, which is pretty respectable. Now again, not all of these will be playable in Commander or, you know, in your deck strategy, but like we said earlier, you probably won't want 30 to 40 Sagas anyways, you know, 15 to 25 of them will probably be sufficient. Now because Gen lets you dig Sagas out of your graveyard, you'll probably want to focus on other Sagas that do well when your graveyard is full. Now, the Eldest Reborn, Elspeth Conquers Death, at Carters vs. Return, all of these have similar abilities on their third chapters. These sagas let you return a creature card from your graveyard, or in the case of the Eldest Reborn, uh, from any graveyard, to the battlefield. So having lots of cards in your graveyard gives you more access to creatures to reanimate with sagas like this. And of course, that full graveyard will also give you more sagas to reanimate with Gen's ability. So sagas can work really, really well in a Gen deck. You'll probably also want cards that help you fill your own graveyard. Uh, Timoret Calls the Dead is a fitting choice here. Now, the first two chapters of this saga make you mill three cards, and then you can exile a creature or enchantment from your graveyard to create a 2-2 zombie creature token. Now, we don't care too much about zombies in this deck, but we can just sacrifice Timurit Calls the Dead to Gen's ability uh, when it's done milling us to bring back another saga, uh, perhaps one that we just milled. So this deck is starting to sound more and more cool. Do I need to build this one? Now, if you liked replaying dead sagas from your graveyard with Gen, 
you might also consider Hannah Ship's Navigator. Hannah is a 1-2 human artificer that costs 1 blue-white, and you can pay 1 white-blue and tap her to return an artifact or enchantment from your graveyard to your hand. Now this tap ability has the same mana cost as Gens, 3 mana, and you don't have to sacrifice an enchantment to use it. But it does return the enchantment from your graveyard to your hand rather than to the battlefield like Gens ability, so you'll need to use more mana to recast it. So do you want the mana savings that Gen offers, or do you want the resource savings that Hanna offers? It's your choice, but I will point out that a Hanna Saga deck will only have access to 12, approximately, total sagas. So in a Hanna deck, you'll be leaning pretty heavily into other enchantments and other enchantment synergies. Uh, you could try to mill yourself to fill your graveyard with sagas for Hanna to recur, uh, but without black in our color identity, our self-mill won't be quite as effective, uh, though blue can do quite a bit here too. But really, in a Hanna deck, I'm much more interested in accelerating my sagas with Proliferate for some explosive plays, and then recurring them with Hanna to use again. And fortunately, white and blue are among the best colors of magic for cards with the Proliferate mechanic. Uh, Inexorable Tide, Thrumming Bird, Flux Channeler, for example, but there's plenty of others. And because you're going to be proliferating, you can use other enchantments that benefit from Proliferate. The Hoofprints of the Stag or Ominous Seas, for example, are a couple of enchantments that get counters whenever you draw a card, and then you can remove some of those counters to generate creature tokens. And you can proliferate those counters, of course, too. Now, finally, as long as we're proliferating, and as long as we need lots of mana to recur and recast Sagas with Hanna, we might consider running the new Replicating Ring as a mana rock. Now, this has nothing to do with Sagas, but it will benefit from proliferate. This is a 3 mana artifact that taps for 1 mana of any color, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a knight counter on replicating ring. Then if it has 8 or more knight counters on it, you remove all of them and create 8 colorless snow artifact creature tokens named a replicated ring, and those artifact tokens have tap at 1 mana of any color. So proliferate will really help us multiply the replicating ring a lot faster, and we can really use that mana that those 8 uh, replicated rings will generate for us. But that's enough about Hanna, let's talk about flickering our sagas to abuse them. There are plenty of blink commanders out there, but the only ones that reasonably let us flicker our enchantments are Brago King Eternal and Yorion Sky Nomad. Brago is a 2-4 spirit that costs 2 white blue, it has flying, and your opponents will definitely not believe you when you try to tell them that you're not playing one of those Brago decks. Whenever Brago King Eternal deals combat damage to a player, you exile any number of target non-land permanents you control, then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. And then Yorion Sky Nomad is a 4-5 Bird Serpent that costs 5 and 2 Hybrid Azorius. It has flying, and when Yorion enters the battlefield, you exile any number of other non-land permanents you own and control, and you return those cards to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. So just like Hannah, both of these commanders are Azorius colors, so you'll only have again those 12 sagas to pick from, and that definitely does limit their uh, capability as a commander for a saga-themed deck. Now, flickering your sagas will help you reuse them indefinitely, but it won't accelerate them. So rather than focusing on explosive wins in a deck like this, you'll likely need to focus instead on board control and incremental value. You might use protective enchantments like Ghostly Prison and Propaganda to protect yourself while you generate value. Uh, Brago, of course, will require you to provide protection for him and let him get in for combat damage to trigger his ability uh, with cards like Whisper Silt Cloak. And with Yorion, you can use creature blink effects like Momentary Blink to flicker Yorion and then generate flicker effects for your sagas. And of course, these blink spells can be used to protect Yorion from targeted removal too. Now, if we want to access more than two or three colors to maximize our selection of sagas, the first recommendation I'd make is Atraxa Praetor's Voice. Though again, you'll have to convince your playgroup that you're not playing one of those Atraxa decks. Atraxa is a 4-4 with Flying, Vigilance, Lifelink, and Death Touch. It costs green, white, black, blue, so it gives you access to any non-red saga. And it has, at the beginning of your end step, Proliferate. Okay, so the Atraxa Sagas deck is pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll proliferate, uh, both from Atraxa and from other cards, uh, to accelerate your sagas for explosive value. If you cast a saga with Atraxa on the battlefield, uh, you'll get the first trigger, um, the first chapter trigger right away, just like normal. And at the end of your turn, Atraxa will proliferate, giving you the second chapter. 
And then at the beginning of your next turn, uh, right after your draw step, you'll get the third chapter. So the cool thing about Atraxa is that she reliably triggers your second uh, saga chapters uh, before your opponents have too much time to respond, uh, again at the beginning of your end step. Freeja's Retribution, for example, gives you an angel token immediately, and it lets Atraxa tap to kill another low-power creature at the end of your turn uh, when the second chapter triggers because Atraxa happens to be an angel. Kiora Bests the Sea Guide can tap down an opponent before they have too much time to respond, again at the end of your turn, if, if uh, Atraxa is on the battlefield. Phyrexian Scriptures almost becomes that ideal 4-mana sorcery speed board wipe, uh, rather than delaying the board wipe until your next turn. Now, because Atraxa doesn't recur spent sagas, and because she lets you accelerate your sagas, you'll want to include plenty of cards that either refill your hand or recover those spent sagas from your graveyard. But the commander I'm most excited to talk about is, of course, the most inarguably awesome, the most versatile commander in all of magic. It needs no further introduction. It is Golos, Tireless Pilgrim. As I'm sure you're all aware by now, Golos is a 3-5 artifact creature that costs 5, and it lets you search your library for any land, not just a basic land, any land, and put that land onto the battlefield tapped when Golos enters the battlefield. You can also pay 2 and Wooburg to sort of do a Narset thing, but we honestly don't even care about that right now. Okay, so there's three compelling reasons to play Golos. First, you get all five colors, so you can use any and all of the sagas that you want. Second, you get Hall of Heliad's Generosity, and not just somewhere in your deck, but on the battlefield, every game, if you want it, because Golos is just that awesome. Now, just for reference, Hall of Heliad's Generosity lets you pay one and a white and tap it, uh, to put an enchantment from your graveyard on top of your library. Of course, you'll naturally end up with sagas in your graveyard, and so Hall of Heliad's Generosity makes perfect sense in any sagas deck that has access to white. But the most compelling reason to play Golos, I think, is Nesting Grounds. This is a land that lets you pay one and tap it to move a counter from target permanent you control onto another target permanent you control. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. And I guess, you know, at a distant fourth, if you happen to have one, you can also play Sarah's Sanctum and tutor that out with Golos as well. But anyways, we talked about removing lore counters from our sagas to keep them around indefinitely. We talked about accelerating our lore counters for more explosive plays by adding lore counters to them. Nesting Grounds does both of these at the same time. For essentially two mana, that is one mana and tapping Nesting Grounds, you can move a lore counter off of one saga and put it on another saga. So you're repeatedly triggering one chapter of the former saga and accelerating through the chapters of the last one. And if you don't have a second saga to put that lore counter on, fine, you can put it on anything. A land, a creature. You can even move lore counters from sagas onto Myth Realized or Scroll of the Masters, which can actually use lore counters. Now, they don't particularly synergize with our game plan, well, aside from being an enchantment in the case of Myth Realized, but it's an interesting synergy. Now, Nesting Grounds is so amazing in this build that I would definitely run effects like Fate Stitcher and Voyaging Seder uh, to untap Nesting Grounds so you can use it more than once per turn. And note, though, that because you can only tap Nesting Grounds as a sorcery, uh, cards like Seedborn Muse and Wilderness Reclamation won't be helpful here. But that is my primer on sagas. I really think after Kaldheim, they're finally in a place where we can start to build a few decks that you know, focus heavily on sagas. And as we can see, most of these builds will go for a somewhat controlling strategy, uh, but there's at least a few different ways that we can go around building these, uh, these types of decks. But that's all I have for today. Please like this video or subscribe if you found any of this useful. I make commander-focused content showing you all sorts of unconventional ways that you can build your commander decks, from budget alternatives to deck decks to top 10 lists. And thank you for watching.